Great. Uh, well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, if you're anything like Ottawa, you're maybe in a heat wave right now. So appreciate you ending your heat wave day with a casual workshop on talking to politicians about basic income, um, a light and happy way to end your day. Well, maybe for some of us. Um, we are here today. This is the second workshop in part of a series on basic income activism that's being co-hosted by the Basic Income Canada Youth Network, or BICYN, and the Ontario Basic Income Network, or OBIN. A couple months ago, we had a really great session about how to write letters to the editor as basic income advocates, and we've heard from lots of folks that they'd like these sessions to continue. So this is our second part of the series, which is specifically, as the title would suggest, um, how to engage in conversations with your elected officials with politicians around the topic of basic income. Um, so we're really excited today. We've got a great lineup of some tips and some tricks. And then we'll also be hearing from a guest speaker who is a former politician who perhaps has been talked to about basic income, about some things that, that he might find particularly compelling. So just a couple kind of um, pieces to consider before we get started. Uh, close Captioning is available for accessibility purposes, um, live, live generated by Zoom, so you should be able to enable or disable that at the bottom of your screen if that's useful to you. Um, also, just for, for, for visual accessibility, our slides are white and blue and purple, and we've got some cute graphics posted here and there, um, including one of a hand holding a megaphone here on the main slide, but our speakers will make sure that all of the material on the slides are conveyed verbally um, so folks know what's going on. This session is also being recorded, so we're able to share it afterwards. If you don't want your face to be visible on the recording, you're welcome to turn your camera off, um, but we expect it will mostly be viewed by, by advocates and other people who are interested in the topic. Um, typical kind of Zoom etiquette, please put yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Um, I think that's pretty much the main concern for this one. And we'll have some time for Q&A at the end of the session, but if you have any questions that come up throughout, feel free to pop them in the chat so you don't forget them. But uh, other than that, welcome, and we'll jump right in because we've got an exciting evening planned. So just quickly around an agenda for what we're going to do tonight, we'll start off in a moment with a land acknowledgement and then jump into some introductions. Uh, we'll then move into why meet with politicians about basic income. Many of you here are probably already sold on that fact, but we'll just remind you in case you're still back and forth about it. We'll then go into advocacy meetings 101, so sharing some advice, some tips, some promising practices for preparing, conducting, and following up after meetings with politicians. And we'll then go into a little bit of some of those pieces about basic income in particular and some kind of key messages or principles about basic income that might be helpful in these types of conversations. We'll then um, share some space with a, our guest speaker who we're super excited to have here tonight, uh, Ted McMeekin. And then we'll end with a wrap up and a Q&A, potentially the chance to do a bit of an exercise if we have time as well. So before officially kicking off today's session, we do want to acknowledge that everybody today we're assuming is calling in from different parts of Turtle Island. I'm personally based in unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabe territory, which is colonially known as Ottawa. We encourage everybody on the call today to approach this workshop in the spirit of decolonization an openness to learning and a commitment to justice, recognizing the importance of basic income activists working across and with other social justice movements. If you know the traditional name of the lands you're calling in from today, we invite you to write that information in the chat and invite everyone on the call today to engage in continuous and ongoing reflection about how the basic income movement can actively work towards decolonization and reconciliation in our advocacy work. So with that said, um, our team is going to do just a quick round, the four of us who are putting on this workshop, we'll do a quick round of introductions. And while we're doing that, um, we would love you to pop in the chat who you are, um, if you're involved with a basic income group, what that group is. If you're not, that's totally fine as well, um, as well as where you're calling in from. I will start. My name is Chloe. My pronouns are she, her. As I mentioned, I'm based in Ottawa on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. Um, I am the co-chair and co-founder of the Basic Income Canada Youth Network, and I also serve as the youth liaison for the Ontario Basic Income Network, and I'm super happy to be here. Do any of my co-facilitators want to go next? Yeah, I will. 
Tracy Smith Carrier, and I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Work at King's University College at Western University. I'm also a special coordinator for the Ontario Basic Income Network and happy to be here tonight. Hello, I'm Katerina Lindman. I'm internal relations coordinator with the Ontario Basic Income Network and uh, my pronouns are she and her and I'm from the um, I'm on the Haldeman Tract, the land on six miles either side of the Grand River that was promised uh, to the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutrals people uh, for their part in the in the war. Thanks. My name is Melanie Davis. Pronouns are she/her. Um, originally, I am from Southern Ontario, it, from um, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory. I'm now located on Anishinaabe Treaty 3 territory in the Robertson Superior Treaty, um, located in the city we, call, we now call Thunder Bay. And I am a um, director of the Basic Income Community Network alongside Chloe. Thanks everyone. And I can see people are starting to pop introductions into the chat. So please, uh, please continue to do so um, while we're kind of kicking off the session and throughout. Um, many of you probably know each other already, but it's always nice to kind of get that, that bit of conversation going. Um, and I'll start us off quickly before turning it over to Katarina, but just with kind of that introductory piece about why meet with politicians. We're sure that many of you here are probably already convinced about that fact if you're here, but just to kind of reiterate the importance of engaging in conversations with politicians, elected or non-elected, about basic income and, and why it matters to you. Um, Every level of government is, is somehow impacted by basic income. We often think about it, um, especially right now, as a federal issue, as, as many advocates are calling for the implementation of a national basic income program. Um, but provincial governments, territorial governments, municipal governments are also, also touched by um, basic income policy and also the effects of a lack of basic income policy. So it's something that you can really draw connections with politicians, regardless of where they're at in terms of jurisdiction. Um, Politicians might not necessarily be aware of the presence and the strength of the movement. So being an advocate, actually having those one-on-one -on -one conversations really helps to demonstrate just how much um, how much buy-in basic income has and how much, um, how much power and how much growth, especially the movement has had in the past year or so. Um, and uh, this is a really important one. Um, many may be more likely to consider an issue that when they've had personal or one-on-one -on -one contact with an advocate. So things like petitions and like form letters, things that you can do um, nicely from the comfort of your laptop um, can definitely be really impactful and especially when they're in really high numbers. Um, but I think the power of that face-to-face -face or phone-to-phone -phone or however that conversation takes place um, can be really impactful. And, and again, that, that personal touch to that advocacy work. And finally, um, assuming you're talking to somebody that you're a constituent of, um, it's important to remember that politicians and elected officials are accountable to you. Um, politicians really do want to hear what their constituents have to say, um, what they care about, what they're thinking. Um, so that's a really important piece of it as well. So again, probably obvious to a lot of you, but wanted to touch on that quickly. And now to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of it, I will hand it right off to, to Katerina to share a little bit about the Advocacy Meetings 101. So go for it, Katerina. Okay, so um, in this section, we're gonna cover like getting a meeting, preparing for and conducting uh, meetings. Next slide, please. So getting a meeting, um, it might be helpful to know when the politician is in their constituency office. So the politician will usually divide their time between the, um, like if they're provincial, like in Toronto or Ottawa, if they're federal and then home in their constituency office. Um, it's even important when you're doing Zoom meetings because they tend to be more free when they're in their constituency office and, and parliament is not sitting. Um, you can send a brief email or a letter asking for a meeting and a short summary of the items that you want to discuss. So basically you want to talk about basic income and why it's so wonderful. Um, it can be useful to have two or three people attend together. Um, but then you need a plan, and that is good to have, though. Um, who, would, who will say what in the meetings? Um, so you play to your strengths. And it also shows more support. And you're actually showing more respect for the um, parliamentarian's time. 
um, that they can meet with uh, several people um, all at once. Okay, next slide. And before the meeting, do your homework. Um, so some background research goes a long way, like get to know your politician. What committees do they sit on? What is their education employment background? What are the issues that impact them? Um, so if you've looked at the website uh, for Ontario Basic Income Network, we talk about basic income and we have different series like basic income and health, basic income and women, basic income and indigenous rights, basic income and the arts, movement for the arts. So you can also emphasize that the business case for basic income based on your politicians' uh, specific interests. Uh, look at their social media feeds because um, then you can learn more about them and what's important to them. Um, and look for similarities and building connections between what they say and how basic income can help. Because basic income is such a, a wide thing that it probably does impact their areas of interest. Um, bring some key takeaways that you can share, for instance, statistics and stories. Uh, stories are good and statistics are good. So they work on different sides of the brain. So it's good to have both of those and use them appropriately to see, see which one lands better with your politician and then keep going in that direction. Uh, you might want to expect some pushback, acknowledge and be ready to counter the common arguments against basic income. And the common arguments are that, oh, we can't afford it. Another one is, Gee, isn't it going to encourage laziness? So be ready for those. Okay, next slide. And at a meeting, this is a conversation. So demonstrate listening and be inviting. Um, another idea is to state your ideas as beliefs, not as universal truths. I believe that. And then that also makes it like personal and no one can argue with, this is my belief, right? So that's a good way to do it. Um, Open the conversation by asking for their thoughts. Dig deeper with open-ended questions such as tell me more about. Acknowledge their point of view. I understand your concern that. And this is really important. Seek agreement and common ground. I would like to see ABC as well. Soften differences with yes and rather than yes but. Like you're trying to build relationships. So you want to. Um, be encouraging and try to agree with as many things as you can so that you are then um, a trusted partner um, for them. And look for ways to keep the relationship and the conversation going. I will look into this and get back to you with more information. Oh, and one thing I forgot to say earlier is when you are researching about the politician, look for something that you admire that the politician's done and open with a, a sense of gratitude for what the politician has done. Um, and if you need to kind of keep looking for something, keep looking until you can sincerely say, I'm really grateful for you, to you for doing this. Okay. When, um, when meeting those likely to disagree, wait, is this mine or is this Melanie's now? This is mine now. Yeah, okay, take... sorry. Oh, no worries. <laughs> um, <laughs> so just expanding on some of the things that Katarina has touched on earlier, um, I think it's important for us all to know that no matter what party stripe the politician wears that you're going to meet with them, um, there's always potential for pushback on the topic of basic income, and it can come from progressive group, uh, politicians it can come from conservative politicians it really depends on the person and if you have an idea of whether or not they're likely to support or not the basic income going into the meeting that's great but it's always good to be prepared um, and anticipate kind of arguments that the politician may have when you go into these meetings so it is helpful to emphasize that basic income is a nonpartisan so solution. Um, there are people from all walks of life that support the implementation of a basic income in Canada, whether that be um, people in the medical field, uh, business people, so there's a large group of CAOs that support um, 
you're going to find someone in every walk of life that supports a basic income and you can kind of use that to leverage the arguments that you're bringing forward based on their background. Um, so we see here that you might prepare to share with a more conservative politician that basic income would be cost effective, reduce bureaucracy in government, promote indi individual freedom and entrepreneurialism. Oh, Sorry about that. <laughs> so, but there's also, it's important to acknowledge that this could come from um, other folks that you might expect to be more supportive that perhaps are not interested in a basic income or they have concerns. So I know that in my experience, I've seen that um, there, there's a, a big debate in the progressive field um, for and against um, a basic income. And that's what interested me. That's right, Tracy. That's what we're hoping for. Um, there's what butted my interest in basic income research was a divide on the in progressive politics on whether or not basic income is a solution to a wide array of issues. So it's important to kind of sit back and take a look at what those potential arguments could be based on their political alignment and really think about how you can bring this to them to move the conversation forward. So you can think of your meetings with politicians in four parts for, of a conversation. So you can start by making an introduction of who you are and where you come from in kind of the basic income world and what you do in your role and who you engage with. Um, and then you're going to make your pitch and talk about why we need a basic income. So this is where you're kind of focusing on the six principles of a basic income and being mindful to tailor those to the individual's political preferences. So if we're looking at our six basic in, um, principles for while meeting with a conservative, you might want to, want to try and insert some more conservative messaging to kind of appeal to them as you engage in this conversation. Um, when we are focusing on the conversation with our politicians, it's important that you find ways to address their concerns and bridge commonalities that you find with their concern that come into solutions, um, provide solutions for um, the, their issues based on the basic income. And then towards the end, you're gonna wrap, her up, wrap up with summaries, key takeaways. Um, this is a great time to kind of revisit any stories or data that you found you realized really resonated with individuals while you met with them and talk about ways you can reconnect, whether that's setting a date for another meeting or um, <laughs> or set or um, finding some time to kind of touch base in the future and make sure that you can continue to engage with them and maintain that relationship with them. So some do's and don'ts of meeting with your elected representative, representatives. Um, some the do's are to start, avoid some avoid the jargon that you, you use and try to make sure that you're using language that is accessible to anyone. Um, we know there's a wide variety of backgrounds folks can come to come from before come getting into politics. So it is important that we make sure that our conversations are um, for people who are interested but maybe not previously informed on these topics. And that way you can ensure that things aren't getting kind of confused or misconstrued when you're trying to make certain points. It's also important to stay focused and work on connecting in, as well as convincing. So sometimes when we're very passionate about a topic, it can it, and it's near and dear to our hearts. We get really stuck on trying to convince this, pers this person that this is a good idea. And that can sometimes get in the way of connecting with the in individual and building that relationship that can help them understand your perspective a little bit better on the topic. Um, and this also um, flows into that previous point is tailoring your message to your audience. So being prepared to kind of have some pushback based on 
the arguments you see them make, the issues they typically stand up for, and kind of what their party platforms or priorities are, and tailor your message accordingly to make sure that you can land some of your key points and move forward. Some don'ts when you're going into these meetings is don't be afraid to ask for, ask clarifying questions. Um, sometimes that things don't necessarily come off as clear as you'd like them to be, and it can be helpful to ask for clarification and get a better understanding of this individual's perspective, experiences, et cetera, so you know what really resonates with them moving forward. It's also important to try not to get sidetracked. Um, often we don't have a lot of time in these meetings, and having 10 minutes that kind of stray away from the conversation about basic income means that you've eaten up a third of your time in this meeting and you kind of lose that background to really move on the issue. Um, and this can be a tough area to balance when we're focusing on trying to connect with them, but also trying to, to keep things on brand. So it can be a difficult area to balance and you just have to kind of gauge accordingly. It's also important not to point out that the person is wrong on a topic. Um, this can be a little bit uncomfortable for some people. Um, you may want to frame these kind of conversations as what ifs uh, instead of actually and kind of bring it back as questions um, instead of pointing out as fact that something may not be the way that they've construed it to be. And the last is don't try to win the conversation. And sometimes that can be tempting. I know I have a hard time with that sometimes, um, but it's a relationship building, it's not a debate. So it's important to remember that although the goal at the end of the day is we, we want to see a basic income come to fruition, uh, one conversation won't be the be all end all and carrying the relationship forward is what's really important here. So as much as we want to have individuals uh, see the benefits of a basic income, if it doesn't happen in one conversation, that's okay. It's as long as you can kind of develop that relationship and move forward to continue chatting with that person about why you think it's important. So after the meeting, um, it's important to send a, now I have my cat joining me on my chair. So there's no shortage of interruptions on my end. Chloe knows this very well. Uh, so after the meeting, you wanna send a short email to thank the politician for their time, summarize what you heard at the meeting and follow through on any of those initiatives that you said you would take. If there was an article that came up that you said you found interesting, um, any resource in the, in the community you think are important for them to know about, be sure to follow up on that and share that with them so they know that these, these initiatives are out there, not only across Turtle Island, across, across their constituency, but with right in their community and there's people talking about and moving on basic income. Now I will turn it over to Tracy to talk about how to advocate for basic income. Thank you very much, Melanie. And uh, I have a dog in the background, a couple of kids too. So we'll see <laughs> what my background noise is like tonight. Um, so I get to talk about advocating for a basic income and perhaps we can go to the next slide. I always think it's helpful to start with um, the principles and value statements that undergird uh, basic income. So um, just quick points about the fact that you know it's really about adequacy. It has to be enough money for people to live on. It promotes autonomy, offers people more choices. It promotes dignity, so there's no stigma attached. Um, quality of opportunity offers opportunities for everyone. Um, a key one is about the fact that it's non-conditional, so there's no strings attached to it, uh, unlike our welfare programs today. Um, and universality of access. So anyone who needs a basic income um, should get a basic income. So starting with those values and principles is, is really helpful. Next slide, please. Um, and I know Katerina and Melanie also talked about um, coming prepared, preemptively prepared to counter some of those common concerns about basic income. So the three ones that generally come up, you probably have had them in your conversations already 
Number one, we can't afford it. It's too expensive. Um, and I think really sort of highlighting the fact that um, during COVID-19, the government was certainly able to drum up the money um, for the for the CERB and the Canada Recovery Benefit. Um, so it's a really a matter of priorities, right? If we, if we make it a priority, we certainly can do it. Um, and we know that uh, income transfers uh, go directly into the economy with most of it spent on food, rent, and other, other important needs. Um, and we have basic income programs already in place. Um, the Canada um, Child Benefit and a lot of our pension programs um, really do sort of highlight the fact that basic income has been shown to be effective and we already have it in our tax infrastructure. So it's a matter of expanding it to ensure that other people are that everybody is included in this. Um, the other piece um, that uh, Katerina mentioned, the, the whole laziness argument, that people will all of a sudden start, you know, stop working. Um, but there has been absolutely no evidence to support this, um, that basic income pilots and other uh, unconditional income programs reveal the same results consistently. People either work the same, they work more, or they work differently. So sometimes people take a time off of work to start jobs uh, um, or go to better jobs, maybe to start their own businesses. A lot of people want to go back to school or retrain. Um, and, and some people want to stay at home and care for, care for their families um, or volunteer or maybe combine unpaid work with their em employment. Um, so there's really no evidence for that one. Um, and then the whole notion um, that that basic income um, would be offered and everything else, we'd be stripped of everything else. Um, that's also one that we we often hear. Um, and basic income advocates in Canada have all, have always said that we advocate for basic income plus, meaning basic income plus all of the other supports in our social safety net, um, and that we don't need to give up other programs that are vital. Um, that we can certainly combine these programs with with health, education, and child benefits um, that we know have uh, incredible outcomes for, for people. Um, and, and, and the argument should be central here that no one should be left wor worse off as a result of basic income, um, which, um, well, I won't, I won't mention anything about the pilot there because it makes me bitter. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, so now it is my great honor and privilege to introduce our guest speaker um, for this evening, Mr. Ted McNeekin. Ted has been a seasoned politician for several decades, and I'm certain he has much important insight to share with us tonight. After completing his undergraduate and graduate de uh, degrees in social work from McMaster and Wilfrid Laurier, Laurier Universities, respectively, Ted first entered politics as a city councillor of Ward 7, uh, Ward 7 that's uh, Hamilton Mountain, in the city of Hamilton, after which time he served as the mayor of Flamborough for a period of six years. Following his tenure as mayor, Ted moved into provincial politics, and this is where I first met him as a liberal backbencher and a member of provincial parliament who actually had a heart for social work education. He gladly accepted the request to take me on as his social work student intern, where he had me work on a research paper calling for more participatory and deliberative forms of democracy, work that later led to the formation of the Ontario Citizens Assembly. Serving for almost two decades as an MPP for the province of Ontario, Ted has held many important portfolios in the McGuinty and Wynne governments, including serving as Minister of Municipal, Municipal Affairs and Housing, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, and Minister of Community and Social Services. While in office, Ted pressed for many progressive policy reforms, including adding his voice to the growing calls for a pilot in the province of Ontario to empirically test the benefits of a basic income. We are delighted that Ted can join us this evening to share with us his thoughts on how best to engage in effective advocacy with politicians. So without further ado, please welcome with me, Mr. Ted McNeegan. Oh, and please remember, if you have questions, please add them to the chat as we go along. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ted. Hold the audio now unmuted. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? No? Yep, sounds good, Ted. Okay, good. Um, 
you know, thank, thanks. It's great to be here. And uh, Kateri you, Katerina and uh, Melanie and, uh, well, all of you, you were just great. Uh, you could you could give my, uh, I think you had probably given whatever I was going to say by way of, <laughs> of sharing. And, uh, but let me start with, with at the most appropriate spot. Um, I uh, came to know Tracy. She was uh, the first of 10 MSW students that I had the privilege of learning from. And uh, it, Tracy, I wasn't kidding the other day when I wrote and said, I learned more from the students I had the privilege of working with than I, I'm sure I ever shared. But, um, and we're still referencing your paper on deliberative democracy here in the, uh, the great town of, uh, of Dundas. So uh, thank you for all of that. Um, I thought I might start just by sharing a few stories um, uh, of uh, things that have uh, I've seen work. Um, I had occasion when I was Minister of Community and Social Services. Uh, I'll tell the story and then I'll, I'll talk about the principle that it, it uh, reflects in terms of talking or making a presentation. I, I went with Michael Gravel, who was the Minister of um, Northern Development into uh, three uh, uh, fly-in uh, indigenous uh, communities. And um, uh, it was quite an experience, um, you know, lots of challenges there. One of the communities I was in, I uh, was told uh, by the chief that 90% of the folk on the reserve uh, were suffering from diabetes. So, you know, diet was a real issue. And uh, when we went to the community hall, there was a presentation and it was, it blew me away, it was just brilliant. They, they had a, a, a big screen up and they showed two slides. One was what the cost of the Campbell's can of tomato soup costs in downtown Toronto, 59 cents. One is what it cost on, on the reserve, you know, 389. One was the, the cost of a dozen eggs in Toronto, 210. Uh, in, in the general store on the reserve, $17, you know. And it quickly became apparent uh, why uh, why a lot of folk up there probably weren't eating very well. Um, and uh, so anyhow, bottom line was uh, they took the time to put together a presentation. Uh, they obviously had done a bit of research about who Michael and I were and uh, what might catch our hearts. And they did that very effectively. I came back to Queens Park, called my deputy minister in and told her the story and she was, uh, she was almost in tears from what she was hearing and uh, said, what can we do? And, and so we talked about it and we ended up adding uh, to the uh, OW or, DS, or ODSP uh, um, uh, payment uh, to individuals, uh, $200 per family and an extra $50 uh, for each of, of the kids. And I think the cost came to something like, I don't know, $23 million or so, but uh, um, and I said to the uh, deputy, do, do we need legislation to make that happen? She said, oh, no, we can just, we can just, you know, fiddle and fart around a bit and make it happen. So we did. And uh, that program is in place uh, until Mr. Ford finds out about it, I suspect. So don't tell him, okay? Um, anyhow, uh, that's, that's one story that uh, um, emphasizes the principle of being prepared and understanding who your audience is and then appealing to, uh, to their moral sense. Uh, it's not just an economic issue, but they did that very skillfully. Um, when I was Minister of Community Social Services, um, I traveled the province um, and uh, I was particularly concerned, uh, and Tracy, you'll remember this, with uh, some of the challenges in the developmental uh, uh, services sector. Uh, I met with parents uh, all across Ontario and there all kinds of things were shared, but the one overwhelming thing that we heard um, was uh, what happens when my child dies? I'll be, he or she will be 50, 55. Uh, I won't be there to help. Um, um, you know, what is gonna happen? Um, and uh, and the other question we heard a lot about was, uh, you know, there's a backlog on passport applications for basic funding. And I think we were doing like 16 a month when I asked the deputy minister and I, 
suggested to her I wanted to be doing 16 a day. I think we ended up doing 16 a week. But in any event, um, we needed uh, some additional resources. And um, you, you sometimes you've got to you got to focus. Uh, don't try to boil the ocean. Decide who it is you got to convince, and just focus your attention there. Uh, in this case, it was the premier, and uh, who had a heart for these kinds of things, and uh, and the minister of finance. I the premier was easy. Uh, she said, "Sure, um, I think we can do that." But the minister of finance was a harder nut to crack. So I went to see him and there's no way he was going to budge on it. Um, he, he was uh, just not uh, inclined to uh, give in some of the budget pressures. Um, so I was beside myself. I didn't know what to do, but I had a friend who was working uh, uh, as a uh, consultant in the uh, um, Catholic diocese uh, with Cardinal uh, Collins. And um, he introduced me uh, to him and I had a 15 minute appointment and I was in the office for about 80 minutes. And the Cardinal really took to, uh, to the, uh, the very sad plight that I was describing to him and said, uh, look, minister, is there something I can do? And I said, well, yeah, there might be, you know, the finance minister is a good Catholic boy um, and I'm not having any luck with him. We're, you'd be prepared to, to give him a call and take him to lunch and, and maybe suggest to him that it'd uh, be nice if we could do something in this area. And he said, uh, yeah, leave that with me. Well, guess what? He did. And uh, when the budget was presented a couple months later, I got uh, advance no about two minutes advance notice that with there, there was 800 million, 800 million in new dollars there to uh, help with uh, a pilot project on housing, uh, the developmentally challenged folk, as well as uh, cleaning up the passport uh, uh, situation. So uh, I remember going over and, uh, after the budget was done because he was sitting in the special seats and I, I gave him a fist bump. How often do you get to fist bump a cardinal? You know, it was pretty, uh, pretty something. Um, I did uh, over the years, uh, four private members bills. The, the first couple passed, but didn't go anywhere. Uh, one was about uh, doing a basket of uh, an estimate of various cost of uh, various baskets of uh, needs uh, for people on OW. Passed unanimously, but went nowhere. And uh, I soon learned that the way to get things done was, was not to be a lone ranger. But uh, they say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And um, so I, uh, on the last uh, four bills, which I got passed, all of which were implemented, by the way, I sought out uh, conservative and NDP co-sponsors. And guess what? It's kind of hard to argue against the bill on the other side of the house if one of your own members is co-sponsoring it, right? So we got uh, insulin pumps for juvenile diabetics. We got a, an advisory group on lung disease. Uh, uh, there are a couple of other things that I don't off the top recall, but it was, uh, it was good. Um, on the insulin pump one, there, the importance of doing your homework, I think uh, maybe, uh, was that Katerina or Melanie was talking about that? Uh, uh, really important. Um, we had a bill passed uh, um, uh, unanimously and nothing happened. And uh, George Smitherman was the Minister of Health and I went to see him and he said, Teddy, there's no friggin' way that's gonna happen. We just can't afford it. Anyhow, but in the process of the research, I discovered that the finance minister, Dwight Duncan, when he was uh, an ordinary backbencher, had uh, proposed a bill to uh, fund insulin pumps for juvenile diabetics. So I went to see him and we talked and talked and talked. Finally, he, he said, you know, you know, look, I know you didn't come in here just to have coffee and talk to me. Why, why the hell are you here? And I said, well, I wanted to I will find out if the Dwight Duncan, who was the uh, rabble rousing uh, MPP uh, early in his career is the same person. Well, what do you mean? And I said, well, um, you sponsored the bill to bring in uh, fund uh, uh, insulin uh, pumps for juvenile diabetics. Yeah, I did. That was really important. I said, well, do you know that uh, twice I presented a private member's bill on that and it's passed unanimously? I didn't know that. 
right? And I said, well, that's true. And I said, you're so busy solving all the macro problems, you know, everything that's urgent, you don't have time for the important minister, right? This is really, uh, really critical. So again, five minutes before the next budget came along, uh, I, I get a note from, uh, from uh, somebody in the finance saying it's $17 million to purchase insulin, insulin pumps for juvenile diabetics. Minister of Health came over and he shook his head. He said, I don't know how you did it, Teddy, but uh, you know, it would, would never have got through my office. Anyhow, things like that. There was a, a situation on campus. Um, uh, I have three post-secondary institutes, institutions in my writing or head. And I uh, met four times a year with a student advisory committee. And we, uh, out of that came a lot of changes in post-secondary education that we can trace right back there. Um, but McMaster needed a humanities building to integrate some of the various faculties and uh, it had been a, a longstanding need. Um, there had been requests go to the government and uh, letters and the response came back that our government wasn't funding anything except science and engineering buildings. And uh, the students were really, uh, well, they were pretty ticked off when I told them that. And, uh, and I've been making a point at every meeting about how we could work together and leadership is relational and to do your homework and uh, don't send don't send petitions or form letters, do written letters and phone calls. And and one of one of the one of the I guess I could, one of the young people said, uh, well, Minister, we'll take you up on your challenge. Why don't we de develop a challenge, develop a strategy to go after the government on this? So we did. They did. They did that. The 300, uh, 300 handwritten, 310 actually handwritten letters went to uh, uh, the Minister of, uh, of uh, Training Colleges and Universities. I was the parliamentary assistant at the time, so I had a bit of an in and uh, a lot of phone calls. And when we did, the, we gathered together to look at how we were going to divvy up uh, limit, limited capital dollars. I started pulling these letters out and reading them. And finally, the minister said, enough, enough, enough. What do, what do you need? And I said, well, to make this humanities building happen, we need uh, $45 million. And uh, he looked at me and said, uh, uh, I can only give you $44.5 million. I said, okay, why, why the shortfall? He said, well, I don't want it. I don't want you walking around saying I completely caved into you, right? Anyhow, we got that money. The building is now in place. And uh, two thirds of those students took the time to write another personal handwritten letter to the premier, just thanking her and the finance minister for their work. So there are ways that you can get at things that uh, you may not... Uh, you may not uh, fully uh, fully comprehend at the time, but uh, the key is to uh, to have a. Uh, uh, and I'm going to to where uh, Katarina and Melanie were. You really need to have a focus. You need to know what it is you want to achieve, and uh, how you're going to get there. And uh, um, don't try to boil the ocean. Right? It's uh, you know you don't have time for all the sidebar stuff. You may have 15 minutes with somebody, right? So you got to focus and, and you got to do your homework and you got to know uh, what it is you want. And if you have a plan B, a fallback position, it would help to have thought that out. I always say to, to, to groups uh, when I chat about this, that it's uh, as important to connect as it is to convince. How you connect is really, really important. Um, one of the, uh, one of you was talking about getting to know uh, the hobbies or some success that the politician may have had. Um, that, that could be a great uh, entree into, uh, into what can happen. Uh, and then you plan and strategize around uh, how you can take advantage of the knowledge that you have uh, to make things uh, happen. And you can tailor your message, frankly, towards uh, um, a politician. If you're talking to, uh, I suspect if you were talking to someone in, uh, in the current provincial government, you might want to uh, go armed with uh, some good economic statistics. Uh, not, not that they're necessarily better financial managers than others, but uh, 
they, they think they are. And, and um, that's important. By the way, there's a communication hierarchy, if you haven't already uh, sort of intuited that. Never send a petition, ever, unless you got 200,000 signatures. Um, and even then, what happens is, uh, you, you know, they politician will keep the cover copy so he or she can read it into the record so they look like they're doing something. And, um, and if they're really desperate, they'll keep all the, uh, the politicians and send them fundraising letters claiming that they were yeah, they, shared, they shared the same concern. Um, form letters are almost as bad. Um, if you're gonna write uh, at all, write a personal note, uh, but even that uh, isn't the best. The best is actually face-to-face -face, uh, contact. And if, uh, if your message is important enough, it needs to be sent through four different channels. You know, uh, and with the age of social media, that's uh, you can YouTube it, you can tweet it, you can write uh, letters to the editor about it, you can meet with people, you, you know. Um, I don't know if you're theological, you could pray about it. You, it goes on and on and on. Um, so you anticipate the arguments uh, that may be barriers and you, uh, you respond to that. Never make a threat, by the way, that you can't keep. Uh, the hunter's creed is never wound what you can't kill. Uh, because if you do that uh, and, and you can't deliver, um, you've lost all influence probably then and forever. You need to understand that the message you think you're sending isn't necessarily the message that is being received. So whoever said something about clarifying it, asking questions, uh, uh, yes, and, right? Um, can I get back to you on that? That's uh, really important. Uh, building ad hoc coalitions is, a, is a, probably the single most important gift any useful politician can bring to the political arena. Um, in uh, the basic income situation here in Hamilton, the, we built a coalition uh, and, and we had a bit of an advantage because we had the pilot project there until it was canceled, even though uh, he said he would never cancel it. Uh, anyhow, that's another, another day. Um, but we were able to actually, by, by way of make, making presentation, get the Chamber of Commerce on side as advocates. And uh, that I think is in the long term gonna make a, a big difference and it helps to build trust too when uh, people see those uh, those kinds of partnerships um i noticed one of the questions in the chat room was it's summer come summertime now uh, how often should we follow up well follow up as often as you're comfortable um, but do it in a focused uh, thoughtful way uh know for example and lead with your lead with your strength i don't know if you know this but in prince edward island all three p political parties agreed to ask uh, and pass the resolution in the Legislative Assembly to ask the feds to partner with them on a province-wide uh, guaranteed annual income. And I wrote to the Premier, I was actually engaged in conversation with the Premier saying anything we could do to help, let us know. And I was, I was seeing PEI as a bit of a wedge, you know, in terms of uh, um, also 61%, according to recent polling of uh, citizens in Alberta like the idea of a basic income. So this idea that, oh, we can't afford it, nobody wants it, um, it's going to have a lot of difficulty now because, frankly, there are a lot of governments across the country who would not um, be perceived as being uh, um, generally supportive of this kind of thing. So uh, maybe the advantage of pilot projects, particularly if they're evaluated and their guarantees made in into the legislation so that uh, if another government's elected, they can't be betrayed and the, and the pilot uh, ended instead of running its course. If we can do that and get the science uh, together, as Julie, Julie Durkowitz uh, proposed in her Bill C-273, you're all aware of that bill, the private member's bill. 77% of, uh, of the um, uh, national liberal policy uh, 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 delegates voted to support uh, basic income. So here in Hamilton, even at my local church, we've raised money. We've, we've raised uh, all together about $3,500 uh, to uh, purchase a thousand uh, basic income signs which uh, like election signs will be placed on lawns all through Hamilton. 
uh, in an effort to remind people, particularly the, uh, the liberal federal uh, party that is already at their convention uh, said they think we should move ahead, hold them a little bit accountable for some of their actions and some of their thinking. Um, I could talk forever and it's a, it's a topic as minister that I had some, some, something to do with in terms of the uh, launching the basic uh, income program. Um, and uh, I should mention in passing as a member of the United Church, uh, Lois Wilson, who's the former moderator, 93 years old, um, has pulled together a, a fairly high profile group of, uh, of ex-politicians uh, to lobby Wayne Easter and the Parliamentary Budget Office, which approved uh, moving this in this direction and assisting Julie Durkowitz. Uh, I did a little bit of work with Julie on the side because she had worked for me in the ministry and we knew each other. And uh, there were a couple people in the ministry that I headed up. Uh, I was not one of them who actually helped, helped her write the bill. So there are different ways that social policy advocates can get involved. Uh, you do some good research, you, you probably want to share it. So I'm going to stop there, Tracy, and uh, I just, just, just end by saying that Tracy was the first of 10 social work students I had the privilege of working with. And, and Tracy, I don't want to embarrass you, but you were always my favorite. And you could not agree with my things. favorite field instructor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Anyhow, you. So I'm done. So if you've got any questions, I'll try to answer them. I think there are a few in the chat as well, but um, let's open up the, the lines of communication and uh, are there, there are questions from the audience? Otherwise, that gives you maybe a, a few minutes for you to review some of the, the questions that are in the chat there. So Katerina and Melanie and the others have done such a good job of answering everything that nobody, yeah, well done. By the way, great format and the research work you did was wonderful. I'm gonna make sure to, to snatch a copy of, uh, of your slide uh, slideshow because I, I can't, of course, give, attributing it properly to you folk there, uh, share it with others who might wanna learn something as well. Good job. I think there was, um, Katerina had her hand up. Katerina. Um, so my question is, should the basic income movement um, try to do something about Prince Edward Island and, and what would we do? Is it to lobby the federal government? How would we make that happen? Well, I wrote to, I wrote to the premier and that uh, ended up uh, with some uh, some uh, other discussion by phone with uh, with the leaders of the opposite and I worked the leaders of the opposition and the third party. I copied uh, the prime minister, Wayne Easter, the finance minister, um, you know, a whole lot of people and uh, it wouldn't do any harm to uh, let the, the premier know that, um, that uh, and you could Google all the names, this PEI, Legislative Assembly, let them know that you're aware of what they're doing, that you uh, you stand in support, and uh, and that you're trying to take the uh, the enthusiastic uh, value based uh, policy that uh, they're advocating and spread that good news throughout the land. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Maybe maybe promised a holiday there or something. I don't know. <laughs> Well, we had a um, question in the chat about you were you mentioning, you know, come prepared with your asks to the meeting. Yeah. What are some good examples of, of asks to bring to these meetings? Well, one, I always say when I talk about leadership, the most important thing a leader needs to know is what they don't know. Right. And so I, I would always say to any to anytime I had a conversation with a political colleague, um, I'm trying to be helpful. Is there something that you need to know that I can help you with, right? What question, you know, to say, what questions do you have? Um, and by the way, if you, if you say you've got an article or you'll get back to them on something, don't fail to do so because, uh, you know, the last thing you want to do when the, uh, the press comes and says, uh, how come you're not making, well, I spoke to minister so-and-so and he says, yeah, and I, 
said I was entirely open and they never got back to me, right? You know, so, uh, um, you know, there's nothing worse. I always say to people, particularly if it's an issue, always be prepared for a decision maker to say, and I, I've done this sometimes, it really throws people off the game. Look, Tracy, I'm absolutely convinced that you're right. What are the five things you want me to do today to make it happen? Duh, you better have an answer, right? Right? And even if it's to say, well, you, well, you could do this, Minister, um, and you'd want to think about this, right? And maybe I can help you or whatever. So, so be prepared with the ask, but also be prepared because, it, you know, a lot of people say, hey, I surrender. I'm on your side, right? I want to help. Just tell me, I'll do it, right? I used to do that all the time with people. They were so perplexed they didn't know where to go. <laughs> I got to answer the question for them. Yeah. Come prepared to answer the questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, how many personal letters or notes would you need to receive for you to be compelled to actually take uh, action on an issue? Was not there some not, not any. No? No, if I got six, I would get up in the house and say every... You know, my entire constituency is on fire after asking about this issue. Because if you get six, every personal handwritten letter you get from somebody is probably the equivalent of about 100 people who have similar feelings, right? So if you get six or 10 letters or six, or six to 10 articulate people who want to phone you, um, uh, that works really well. Although there are some groups, that I got to tell you, I had an experience with a group of people who uh, allegedly were concerned about social service rates, and there were about eight of them came into my office, and uh, they took the position. One would as say something, I'd try to answer, and I'd be interrupted by another, and I'd try to, I'd be deflected, and then I'd be interrupted again, and. Uh, one of my staffers told them that they couldn't smoke in the office. So they said, okay, so they threw the cigarette on their rug and crushed it with their shoe. And then they wondered why we weren't particularly helpful, right? Um, you know, so, you, you, you know, there are all kinds of, uh, of situations you, you run into. I mean, I, I, as Minister of Community and Social Service, I always tried to make the point early that uh, want to hear your ideas, um, I, I'm a social worker by training. My heart's in the right place. We need to work together. We need to be partners. But even then, sometimes you got tomatoes thrown at you, right? You know, so it's uh, it's six of one half dozen of the other, Tracy. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in with a question, Tracy, if nobody's uh, around, which I it just came to me, but I live in a federal minister's riding and yeah. with someone who I think should be on board with basic income, has influence because they're in cabinet, um, but doesn't answer my emails. And I have sent multiple emails, not form letters, personalized notes, and have gotten a couple kind of form responses back from a staffer. Um, so I guess when you're getting blocked, I guess, by an elected official and can't actually get into that meeting with them, what, what, what do you do? Well, you've got some tough choices. Um, um... You can embarrass them, but then you'll never get a meeting, I guess. Uh, or you can call and uh, I wouldn't threaten them. You're going to embarrass them, but you, you maybe see who's close to them, who can have a, maybe a, a quiet word with them. Um, I need to share with you, I think this issue just scares the living daylights out of, uh, you know, we've got a lot of conservative governments across the country. We're using those arguments that you outline. It's too expensive. The people were lazy, you know, um, and um I mean, uh, Senator Forget and others have made some really good uh, uh, economic arguments and there's some good material out there which you want to fam familiarize yourself yourselves with. But even with 77% of at the National Liberal Convention passing this, um, uh, the word I heard from some people on the Hill was we don't want to hand Aaron O'Toole an issue where, you know, he can beat us up. And, uh, you know, here go those wacko liberals again, you know, throwing money around like, it, you know, 
And, and that's not the intent. That's not where people uh, who are serious about this issue are coming from. And it's far and away, uh, very, very far from the outcome that would, uh, you know, our experience in Hamilton, even with a year and a bit of the program was it turned a lot of people's lives around. Went back to school, they paid off debts, they, uh, you know, did all sorts of things. There were also, uh, as a result of the devastation, a couple of suicides, right? Which is why I made the point about making it, you do pilot projects, make a guarantee that somebody can't come in and, and cancel it up from under you. You have a responsibility to do that. But I, but I don't know, the other thing is maybe you just wipe your feet and go on to another politician. You certainly wouldn't want to vote for that person in the next election, I suspect. Yeah. No, they're they're not running anyways. That'll be pretty quick. You can tell where I live pretty quickly, but uh, yeah. We got three in Hamilton and weren't running again. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Other questions from the audience or uh, in the chat? Hold the audio now unmuted space. Chat, expand the space. I have a quick question. Um, emails are simple. Um, phone calls are simple. Are hard copy letters more appreciated and useful? Yes. Yes, they are. Uh, they, at least to me, they are. Uh, emails. Uh, um, we averaged uh, when I was in cabinet at the constituency office about 480 emails a day. Right. Um, this will sound really corny, but if you're going to write a letter, don't write it on white paper, write it on white green paper or white blue paper. Make sure it's nine by 12 instead of eight and a half by 11. So that when it's on the desk, it's hanging out, right? Uh, you draw attention to the fact that you've taken the time to go out and buy this expensive perfume scented paper or, and send it to your favorite uh, MPP or MP. Um, and then uh, if, if you, any chance you can get uh, somebody who knows the, the political person um, and has some uh, influence, um, it was, uh, it's important. Remember when I ran the first time in my by-election 2000, I had uh, done some work as mayor to help the Catholic diocese get a new school there. And uh, there are a lot of people didn't, didn't uh, receive that very well. And I had to go into a, a, a big convent where there were several hundred uh, nuns who were all voting. And uh, so I took it with me, I took a letter from the Bishop that said, thanks. And I took the president of the local Knights of Columbus with me. And every nun in the convent voted for me. It was a matter of doing my homework, right? And, and being, uh, um, and uh, there was one who wasn't, and maybe she was right, who knows? Um, um, yeah. Once you set your foot in the river, the river's never the same, right? And, um, a lot of young people come to me and say, I, I'm thinking of a political career. And I say, well, why, why? Well, I want to help people. And I say, well, why don't, why don't you get married and have a couple of kids, you know? Um, and uh, Tracy did that too, by the way, with this. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, um, so I try to emphasize that if you're going to get involved, um, in an activity that often may seem like a waste of time, um, even to the people who are there, you better darn well have something specific you want to accomplish. And just think of how good we'd all feel if uh, 10 years from now, we had a basic income program across this nation. You know, there are 162 uh, social service programs across the country and uh, and uh, it can be pretty predatory, even within the social service and employment field. Uh, you know, one of the biggest arguments against basic income is how many people are going to lose their jobs. Anyhow, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of cynicism there. 
Oh, absolutely. I'm noticing there's a, um, a question from Lorraine, is it? Lorraine. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing all those great stories. You sound like a very good uh, convincing person. <laughs> well, you're, you're welcome. Uh, as they say, always, always, always narrow your scope so that you're not wasting a lot of time. Yeah, so I'm with, uh, we're, uh, uh, we're together, uh, we're together in the poverty uh, group in Calgary. I just started as a volunteer in the social media area, but I'm curious to know, I'm a little confused. So where would we start? Would we start with um, letters on different colored paper uh, to a, a specific premier of our province, like specific premier, and then a PM? Like, um, um, like how is how would you go about it? Like, um, how do you pick the person to send the letters to? Well, there's some obvious ones. Like, the, I'm assuming you have a minister of uh, social services there. Probably, <laughs> I'm new to this political stuff, so. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so uh, I always say never assume people in the system. Oh. Um, there are people in the system who don't agree with you. The, uh, the best uh, ally you have is somebody inside the system who's really ticked off with what their government's either doing or not doing. Mm. Okay. And if you can plug into that person, and there's always somebody there, always somebody there who uh, will slide you a, uh, an envelope with some information in it or <laughs> have a talk over coffee with you and... Uh, <laughs> Or, or, or give you a clue cool, what's sticking in that craw. files. Hey. Sounds like the U and the X files. <laughs> well, you know, there's uh, there's one politician I knew there who uh, ended up uh, doing some pretty uh, pretty pretty. He he got, went rose through the ranks. And uh, I'm not making this up. Uh, his first three years at Queen's Park, he walked around all the cabinet men. He wasn't in government then. He was in opposition. Mm -hmm. And he literally went through the garbage cans of every, every politician. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he claims to this day that he, was, he, was, he was, became very, very well informed as a result of that. No doubt. What? Yeah, they didn't he, believe in shredding anything? Well, I think I think uh, since since he shared a story three three or four more times than he should have, they they, they invested in the shredders. So I don't think right. that happens much anymore. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Okay. All right then. If there are no more questions, then perhaps we are heading back into our slideshow. Then, Chloe. There's one question from Carrie in the chat, Tracy. Oh, my, my apologies, I missed it. Yes. Carrie, you any re relation to Carrie Price? No. No, I'm Carrie. not. No, I'm not. No. Sorry. No. You'll remember by the way, that's from a the good, city good of Hamilton, Ontario, there about Ontario works. Mm hmm. Okay. So we, we missed your question, Carrie. Do you mind? Do you mind stating it again? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. You, yeah. Okay. So we know that we want this to be federal going through the federal government, delivered through the federal government. So how do we work with the province to see the benefits to move this to the provincial level or move from the provincial to the federal level? Well, like, is there, like, as you said. We had a provincial government go in ahead. Ontario who did that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess every government uh, provincially is a little bit different. Um, I think one of the breakthrough provinces right now looks like it could be Alberta. Mm -hmm. who, who would have thunk that a year ago, right? And uh, the polling there has got them, their own people saying 61% support a basic income program. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so if I were meeting with uh, Premier Kenny or any of his cabinet, I would, uh, I would be saying, you know what? 61% of the people out there might vote for you if you did something really important like that. Right? So they're in a little bit of trouble politically, I suspect, right now, mm -hmm. uh, as are a number of governments, uh, because of, uh, largely, often because and largely because of the pandemic response. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's much more difficult to influence uh, political people through a pandemic. And uh, it's going to be much more difficult to uh, see funding for, you know, your favorite cause coming out of it because governments have invested so many billions of dollars in trying to respond to the needs of people, which by the way, I would, I would, I would build on that and say, well, the, what was the program called? CERT or SERP or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really, really stabilized uh, a lot of people and a lot of lives. And uh, just think of the good we could do if we made that permanent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Lorraine, that's not a very good answer to your question. I apologize. I, I, I'm, I'm very concerned with the, uh, you know, you, you get a cup. It's it's like like whack a mole or whatever it is. You get a couple on side, and then an election takes place. And it's another government. Well, it's really that, sorry. Wouldn't that help raise his um, uh, what do you call character? Character if he helped people with this sort of issue? Well, yes, I think so. And I think our job as advocates would be to help him to understand that. Yeah, so we got to get all our ducks in a row kind of thing and get our facts straight and yep. go back. Got to be everything it's cracked up to be, right? Yeah. Get all your ducks in a row. Right? We're almost there. 66, what do you say, 66%? 61 percent we're almost there i think if we yeah. got to 80 percent we'd be really rolling well you know where this is a marathon not a not a sprint uh, and uh lois wilson um, who's 93 now a former moderator of the church who at 93 is leading this crusade to uh, advance uh, basic income I keep saying to her, well, she shouldn't lead with this. She, she leads with saying, uh, we've been fighting hard for basic income since 1972, right? <laughs> and I say, well, you, you know, Lois, when I hear you say that, I, I, I understand that when others say it's a marathon, not a sprint. And 70, 82, 90, 100, you know, it's 50 years. It's well, I think it's more necessary now than ever. Yeah, I had a I had a Jewish friend say to me, uh, it was a delightful story. She said, um, out of her tradition, she said, uh, every morning when God wakes up, all the angels are gathered together and God asks the question, what is there in my creation that's broken that we can fix today, right? Mm. Now you can drive yourself nuts. Uh, I mean, there must be a thousand things we if you stop thinking about it, you'd like to fix. So I always say to people um, who, uh, you know, get depressed or nervous or anxious, uh, a good way to handle it is to pick one or two things that you understand, do something important and do it really well. And uh, if we have the strength to uh, not sell ourselves short and stick with this uh, fighting on this very important big issue and uh, understanding that our world is uh, is uh, too small for anything but truth and too big for anything but love. Um, anyhow, I, I, I shouldn't do that. But, but you know, that was from the, my, my Jewish friend who had a, a different perspective and I really appreciate it. I use that in, in my Christian circles all the time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all. So much. So much. All right. So I think the next steps.
Um, we'll share the slides, including other resources with uh, registrants. Um, if you want to connect with someone for a meeting and reach out with any questions that perhaps we didn't get to this evening, um, there's the emails there, um, Katarina Lindman or Hello Basic Income Youth. Um, and join us to stay involved. Um, so click on one of the links there and uh, Chloe's added them uh, as well into the chat function. Well done, gang. There we go. Yeah, we'll give you 10 minutes of your evening back, but we'll follow up. I'll fix some of the typos I was fortunate to spot in the PowerPoint before sending them out, um, as well as some other resources that we've drawn some drawn from in creating this deck. But yeah, thank you so much, everyone.